All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a discussion of the Book of the New Sun by Jean Wolfe. I'm holding up my omnibus edition here containing the four books, Shadow of the Torturer and Claw of the Conciliator. And we also have Sword of the Lictor and Citadel of the Otark. So the four books of the Book of the New Sun. We're going to start out non-spoiler. If you want to hang out for a bit and haven't read this, we're going to start out non-spoiler. And then we're going to get big time into spoilers for the entire series, but I will warn you when that happens. Uh, for now, though, let me please introduce my two wonderful guests. And I'll start with Paul Williams, who has been my companion on this journey. And I'm so glad, Paul, that uh, we've been reading this together. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, no, this is, uh, we have finally <laughs> arrived. Uh, like This is the moment where, for me, it all makes sense. There's some degree of sense. I can believe it makes sense. But yeah, Paul Williams, I'm a PhD candidate in English uh, literature, emphasizing fantasy literature at Idaho State University. Uh, almost almost there to the end. Congratulations in advance. Uh, that's a Thank great you. place to be. That's a great, very exciting, very exciting. I'm sure Jared and I both remember the heady days of defending our dissertations. <laughs> yes, I, yes, I do. So, yeah, indeed. Well, speaking of Jared, uh, my other guest here today is Jared Henderson. And uh, Jared is a big fan of this series, so I'm very excited to get his take on it. Welcome, Jared. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to talk about this uh, because I never quite know how to tell people that they should read it. I, I tell people that they should read it, but when they ask, but why is it so good? It, it's actually a very hard case to make. Uh, and then once you've read it, it makes perfect sense, right? And so I'm, I'm excited to talk about this with, with fellow enthusiasts. All right. Fantastic. Now, Jared, I learned something uh, new about you recently, and I did know that you have a PhD in philosophy. But what I didn't know is that there is a kind of linguistic emphasis in your PhD, uh, which is one reason, perhaps, do you, do you agree, that might be one reason why you found, find Book of New Sun to be so fascinating? Because I, I do think what Gene Wolfe does with language is one of my favorite aspects of it. Is, is that something that uh, resonates? Yeah. With you? yeah, I mean, I think I mean, on the very, like the surface level of it, it's just that Wolf is a fantastic writer. Like he is just enjoyable to read. His prose yeah. are enjoyable from start to finish and he's sure. just beautiful. But the, the next stage of it is that Wolf is incredible at blending strange terminology in, in ways um, and introducing things in a way that really effectively world build. Um, I think that in many ways, Wolf is the great example of someone who can show rather than tell when he's talking about his world building most of the time. And a lot of that is through just strange jargon that is never strictly defined that we just kind of learn the meaning of over time. And I just always love that sensation. I love that sensation of uh, just being introduced to new words and then just having to slowly piece together their meaning. Yeah. And I think that there's also a, a philosophical uh, uh, plan behind that as well. Like it's deliberate on his part and it, it's possible that he is experimenting in this way because he wants us to think about the relationship between language and our perception of the world. But the fact mm -hmm. that he drops so many words that, and this is not a spoiler, we're not doing spoilers, but he's dropping tons of words from Latin and Greek. Nobody knows what they mean now, uh, but he just throws them in there and you don't know what, uh, you know, uh, whatever it might be is yeah. and you can't picture it. And it, it, I, I think that he obviously is quite deliberate on his, on his part. He's not doing this <laughs> in a clumsy manner. He's doing it quite strategically. And I feel like he is definitely trying to say something about the relationship between language and our perception of reality and also yeah. the nature of memory and, and, and mixed in there as well. So there's this, so it's kind of interesting. Oh yeah, there's, I mean, this long running kind of question of what is the relationship between language and thought um, and how much does language determine our thought? Yeah. And, and, you know, I actually kind of run into probably a school that thinks it's the, the relationship between language and thought is less extreme than what maybe Wolf might want to endorse here. Uh -huh. But obviously, memory is a, is a major theme uh, of this book, and identity is a major theme, and all of that swirling into thought, and how do we, do we conceptualize the world? And so 
um, introducing all of this weird language, introducing all of this stuff that disorients the reader, right? And so you feel this sense of disorientation when, you, when, when you're uh, being initially introduced to the world. And then the, the uh, and the language kind of indicates to you that like everyone else knows what's going on in some, to, to some extent, but you're not going to know. You're not going to know for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, it's kind of in this idea of like, imagine being thrown into an entirely new culture with an entirely new language where maybe sometimes you can pick out one in every 20 words because um, you happen to share a root language uh, in the distant past. You would just have to piece it together. And how would you do it? You'd do it by forging ahead and trying to figure out things and solve mm -hmm. problems. You wouldn't do it by asking for a dictionary for that probably the probably one wouldn't even exist, right? So you right. just have to kind of immerse yourself and find out. And that mm -hmm. is the experience of reading open the new something. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like he is kind of messing around with uh, the Saper Wharf hypothesis, right? The idea that language influences your perception of the world. Um and it, it, we get to a particular uh, example of this in the fourth book uh, with the Askians uh, and the way they speak. Fascinating. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that because they can only speak in platitudes or sayings that uh, are basically endorsed by the government. Um, so they can only speak in like propaganda, but they can use that to say other things. They figured out how to make that language much more versatile than it might appear. So fascinating. Yeah. Paul? But I think I wanted to add, like, not, and not only is it just language on, like, the lexical level, right, but it's also language on a cultural level, the way that Wolf is blending so much disparate mythology in here, and he's never saying, like, Severian is this, or Aegea represents that, right, and mm -hmm. those things are never firmly declared, and, but we can kind of approximate them as we recognize, like, I've seen this structure kind of in, across, you know, seven different cultural myths and if we stack them together we get a fairly distinctive vision of it all but it's still just an approximation much the way that way that the uh, the language with the archaic terminology uh skews our perspective on things yeah yeah well said yeah so i have uh made a video myself after completing this yes. uh, tetralogy in which i discussed my own feelings about it so I'm not going to go on and on about that, um, but I do want to get a sense of uh, you two are, are big fans of this uh, series, and I really did enjoy my time there. I want to emphasize that that intellectually, I found it deeply satisfying uh, and fascinating. I love the symbolism. I love looking at how, for example, Severian can or may or may not be a Christ figure, that sort of thing. I I I really had fun with that, uh, but I want to get a sense from you two of what you love about this series uh, before we get into the, the the details and the spoilers and stuff. Uh, I want you to not necessarily do a sales job here, but tell me why you're passionate about the series, what you love about it. Um, and uh, I'll start with uh, Jared. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that when I read books, I read them primarily to get that sense of being immersed in a world. Mm -hmm. And I get that. I, I love that sense of, uh, uh, and Wolf, as I've mentioned before, is great. I, I mean, in some ways, it's similar to maybe like what Herbert might try to do with Dune or something, but taken to an extreme. Um, but I also love novels that try to explore big ideas. Um, I'm, I, 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 you know, keep making videos over and over about philosophical science fiction, the science fiction that has some big idea at its, at its core. And while Wolf, does not tell you for a long time what the big idea of, uh, of Book of the News Man is. Turns out there are big ideas and you can really sense that there's something deeper going on in, under the surface. Um, and so this just, I just think about it all the time. I just think about it all the time. You know, I don't think we're going to be talking about Earth of the New Sun. And so I won't say too much here, but I will just say like, you know, with Earth of the New Sun, it's kind of often regarded as like a, uh, Wolf being told that he wasn't clear enough about what Book of the New Sun was about, so he needed to write a, a, a follow-up that would like clearly explain it. It's also very disorienting. Oh. <laughs> so it, like, Wolf being clear is still pretty is pr still pretty obscure and pretty opaque. Um, and I love that feeling. I absolutely love that. Um, and there's this sense of just that there's this, well, I mean, I guess to compare it to a, a really classic work, so suppose that you had never read The Hobbit, right? And you just started with The Lord of the Rings and you start with The Shire, 
and it's this idyllic area. And then you slowly go um, into the forest and you know, there's this weird encounter with, and then you see the elves and you're like, oh, there's something bigger happening. And then there's Tom Bombadil, but you have to deal with old man Willow. So the trees, right? And then there's the Wraith Riders who, and, 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 and everywhere is seeing so there's more and more going on, right? And by the time you get to the Prancing Pony, you don't know what world you're in anymore. <laughs> Even, even like, uh, and then it's just going to get deeper and deeper and weirder and weirder for you. And we take that for granted in the Lord of the Rings because it, it's so culturally, um, like, uh, it, it, omnipresent and everyone kind of know, kind of knows this stuff. But um, with Book of the New Sun, it's like this. You know, at first it's this very local story for Severian, just like the inner workings of this little guild, basically. And you get more and more of it. But then he goes out into the city, and then he goes out into the world. And then it, you know, meets these other things, and then it turns out to be about the entire universe in some way. And um, ah. that sense of the world opening before you as a reader, as it opens before the the narrator, is is a really powerful one. That's pretty cool. Yeah, the world opens up, and of course, he has a very personal journey as well, where he evolves from being a fairly, I would say, unlikable and self centered and very emotionally stunted person and uh misogynist and without really fully understanding um a lot of things and he evolves into i, I would say i would even use, use the, the word compassion uh in places so that that's an interesting journey to, to 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 look at as well um but what i told jimmy nuts when he was starting the series is this is um you, you probably will enjoy it the most if you're a person who is comfortable being uncomfortable um, yeah I think that's <laughs> uh, at least that's how I experienced it. And it, it it definitely pushes me at times because I certainly am someone who's learning to be uncomfortable. Uh, and I like that. I like that challenge. Um, so I definitely resonate with what you had to say there. Paul, what do you love about Book of the New Sun? Why do you like this so much? Yeah, I think that's a really good question because I mean, when we, when we often want to sell someone on a text, we usually talk about how I love this character, right? Or I love this journey. I love, like, we talk about this, we take, make this very emotional appeal. And I've never had a really emotional experience with Gene Wolfe in terms, in this typical sense of immersion and companionship, right? Uh, you know, it, it's not like Le Guin in that respect. Um, but what, but instead, of it, it's, it's for me, it's the emotions of the thrill of just how cerebral this is, but not. It never feels uh, like there's plenty of texts that are super cerebral that I just don't care about. There's something about, I think it's the fact that Wolf is using a very intellectual framing to get at some very emotional and I would even say spiritual concepts and feelings mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that, that I happen to share with him or I think I share with him. And so it's this weird like distancing where I'm never like experiencing Severian's emotions. I'm, I'm, I'm never joined up with him like that. I'm actually having, I'm kind of reading on two levels simultaneously. There's the level of just reading, okay, what are you doing, Severian, and why? But then also this kind of meta level of watching the puzzle, uh, there's this kind of Rube Goldberg of narrative happening. And for me, I get, a, I get a big serotonin rush out of just, I get what's going on. I see it happening. Uh -huh. and, 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 and being able to map out for myself a specific or maybe multiple interpretations. I think that for me, it's, it's similar to like the Christopher Nolan movie in that respect, where mm. the characters are pretty cold, but the ideas are so grand and the mechanism is so captivating for me. And I think some of that comes from, uh, you know, Philip and I are both big fans of Le Guin's essay about uh, El from Elf into Poughkeepsie and her mm -hmm. big emphasis on the confidence of the author. And I think you'd be hard pressed to find an author who is more legitimately confident than Gene Wolfe. He's never begging you to take him seriously, but it's so obvious that you need to take him seriously, that he knows what he's doing. He has a clear vision of where this is going more than any other author I can think of. Uh, but he's never a jerk about it either. Like, I, I don't feel oppressed by Gene Wolfe. I feel like, he, you know, he, he's a very encouraging author like, like, like a good teacher who's just waiting for you to you know just just turn that corner flip that switch click that idea together and he's excited for you when you do it yeah that's a great way to put it yeah fantastic i mean i certainly don't like book of the new sun because i like severing i would say yeah you know it's weird <laughs> like it, it's it's not i actually find it 
like a deeply alienating figure yeah. for the vast majority of, of the series. Yeah. But he's the perfect way to tell the story. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, especially when you put together who the narrator really is, because the narrator is not the Severian that you meet in the beginning at all. Yeah. Know? And uh, that's, I think, a significant thing to, to, to look back. He is narrating this story from a place of kind of in not indifference but you know he's he's on a different plane than the character severian uh so i feel like there's a, a sort of dispassionate voice yeah um that uh is part of his narration because of what he has become by the end of this thing so i guess we should probably start with spoilers here because I'm, I'm i'm dancing around some right now so um but yeah um any further thoughts before we jump into the spoilers for the series Oh. people should read it because it's awesome yeah go read it yes okay especially if you're up for a challenge especially if you're okay with being uncomfortable yeah um, yeah yeah i would say go for it um so all right let's do it let's jump into spoilers and uh, i don't know where you gentlemen would like to start but it seems like severian is a logical place to start and i did mention earlier that he undergoes a a journey of sorts uh, a personal journey an evolution if you will in the process of telling the story we get a sense of this very um emotionally stunted isolated uh and uh very naive uh figure um who begins as a, a member of the torturers guild uh and uh, develops through the course of his journeying um, a, a bit of a conscience uh, and I, I think does by the end show exhibit moments of true compassion uh, and I, I did say uh, allude to the fact that some people think of him as a kind of a, a Christ figure I'm not convinced entirely yeah. but there are some interesting parallels when you think about it because Severian yeah. is a torturer and Christ of course was tortured right um, yeah and uh what was christ tortured on I, yeah i jared you what do you want to say yeah, about sorry that? i i i often kind of push back on severian as christ figure actually mm -hmm. because uh the reason i do that is because it's an easy reading because of wolf because wolf was catholic and so it's right. like very natural to think he might insert this right but the idea that a figure who like takes on the suffering of the world which is like kind of where we end up with severian is not exclusive to a Christ figure, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that it can be a little too limiting. Uh, yeah. um, and so I, I, and that's the, that's one of the kind of reasons that I say calling him a Christ figure might kind of get you in the right direction for understanding Severian throughout, but might not be the, the best characterization. And there's yeah. so many things in which he is very unlike uh, a Christ figure too. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think it's a limited usefulness, but I do feel that Wolf, I, I don't think we can separate his faith from what he's exploring through Severian um, as well. That that part's, that part's certainly true. Uh -huh. Also, I mean, it's hard to not talk about this stuff like immediately, but like literally the Severian at the end of the books is not the Severian that is at the beginning, uh, beginning of the books. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. Because if if memory is tied to your identity at all, yeah. He is a conglomeration of many people, right? And yes. so we talk about Severian being more compassionate, Severian being more self, like less self-serving, being less impulsive. Is that because he as qua Severian has changed? Or is it because the Severian we meet is no longer the Severian who exists? This yeah. is like, this is the big kind of thing that comes up. A yeah, um, big step in that. And that's why he, he, uh, An initial step in that is when he imbibes uh, Thecla's consciousness or whatever yes and he has her memories after that and i think he begins to see from her perspective and then that is just multiplied by whatever when when he yeah it's uh the otark's brain and along with the alzal yes. recipe or whatever it yes is. uh so paul what did you want to say about all that oh so, so uh a couple weeks ago and i should have sent this out and i i, I feel bad i didn't uh so uh someone has recently uploaded to youtube uh a kind of like the cornerstone interview that Wolf ever gave with Larry McCaffrey in 1985, I think. Wow. Um, which I, like, I, I've read a transcript, but if I, in listening, I was like, wow, that transcript is thoroughly edited. Um, 
And at one point in the interview, Wolf says, he said, you know, some people say Perseverance is a Christ figure. I think he's more of a Christian figure uh -huh. uh, because he because he does tag uh, onto the uh, the issue of how Severian is so not like Jesus. Um, and, and I kind of wanted to bring this back to my earlier comment about how, again, there's this overlay of multiple mythologies happening simultaneously. Mm. And so, again, like, even if we want to try and map Severian, if we want to try and, like, torture that's ironic, but who, who want to warp uh, uh, <laughs> Severian's journey onto a specifically uh, like Catholic model of a Christ uh, journey, uh, which again, I think would require a lot of wrestling of the, of the facts. Uh, yeah. But I think even then that's still not Severian, right? Like that gives us some, it gives us an anchoring point to start, but I think it's very important to recognize all the ways that we'll, complicates that and even creates space for contradictory readings. I mean, I'm thinking about in our very first discussion, A Shadow of the Torturer, Philip was pretty, at, uh, not Philip, uh, Matt was pretty adamant about um, arguing, well, Severian is writing this after he's become Otar. So what if this is just propaganda? You know, he's just creating, a, he's, he's inventing a narrative to justify his ascension to power. And that's, I think, one, a perfectly valid reading. That's, I think, a, and I think it's an important one to be recognized that as a valid reading because it creates, a, it, gives, it you know, this brings us into the very postmodern sense of we believe this take on the thing, but we recognize that there are multiple angles from which to view it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. So well, another thing to keep in mind, so let's, let's go back to kind of near the beginning of the, the series. And when he's still firmly in the torturer's guild, he hasn't like he hasn't violated the rules and it's sort of cast out to, um, to do this. Um, what is the celebration that the torturer's guild has? Like they have like a feast yeah. day, right? Right. And yeah. Catherine's day, right? Yes. And clearly, this is Saint Catherine of Alexandria. Saint Catherine yeah. of Alexandria is the is the philosopher saint who is tortured on the Catherine wheel by her own father mm. because she converts. Right. So it's a weird thing where if the torturers. Are, and actually, if you look at iconography associated with Saint Catherine, she stands on the wheel, mm. right? So, like, because so, because it's very much fitting in keeping with like uh, views of martyrdom. She has her glory comes from this, like, from the fact that she was tortured. But then their celebration of Catherine is a very weird twisting of the sort of Catholic Orthodox sort of ancient Christian view of uh, of, of of a tortured martyr. Um, and so, even the the embedded religion of Book of the New Sun in this culture is is clearly inspired by this but it is it's 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 different in a weird way where they celebrate Catherine but they celebrate them as they would have been the one killing her yeah <laughs> and that's and, and and that's a very different place to start i'm thinking now about uh what's her name uh uh the lottery what's her name uh Shirley Shirley Jackson. Jackson. yeah, yeah. i think about, i think about the lottery right where they have this tradition that is that has They've, they've kept the actual tradition, but not the story around it. And I'm thinking about how Wolf is so con is very intrigued and maybe even concerned about the way that tradition itself, the, the practice of tradition carries through despite the narrative around it changing. Uh, you know, uh, again, back to that interview I listened to, because uh, I, I this was a conversation we or a topic we talked about previously in a previous video. The the question about uh, one of the stories, I think, I think, I think it's the story of the, the scholar and his son, or whatever it's called, um, and uh, talks about has had like all these like weird references to like the myth of Theseus versus the Minotaur and other things. And Wolf explains in this interview that apparently uh, the main kind of purpose of that story is the fact that so we have the student who must. Uh, who, who, who graduates by presenting his defending his thesis but theseus destroyed the minotaur and so because so much time has passed since the 20th century by the time of severian that there's actually less time between 20th century academics and the original iteration of the myth of theseus and so mm -hmm. those have actually conflated into one thing so like the minotaur has become has merged with the monitor the, the civil war ironclad and all these symbols get crushed together, but the story, in some way, the tradition has endured. And I wonder if that's. And I, I'm starting to think that that's kind of what Wolf is doing with, to, to Jared's point about, you know, the the martyr of Saint Catherine has arrived at a very non 20th century Catholic 
iteration, and yet it is still there in some way. The fabula is still intact, mm. even if everything around it has been warped. Yeah, we see this again and again. I mean, there's the uh, the picture of the moon, right? Which yes. Cyprian doesn't realize that's the moon. He it looks barren to him because apparently they've terraformed the moon. Yeah, time, yeah. right. Um, so it emits green light. <laughs> yeah, fascinating stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I I tend to agree that it, it would be very simplistic to just label Severian a Christ figure, in spite of certain interesting parallels, like he resurrects people from the dead and that sort of thing. There are some Lazarus yeah. moments uh, in in Book of the New Sun, uh, particularly around uh, someone like Dorcas. Um, but I think yeah. his relationships with people like Dorcas are very important. Yeah. And the development of compassion in him as a character. Uh, is a central theme. Would you guys agree that th his personal development of compassion is, is central to the story? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I think part of this is comes out very clearly in his different attitudes about women, which yeah. gets slightly undermined in my opinion, or said, where he's basically just like, every time I meet a woman, I just like really want to sleep with her. <laughs> like, that's where, it's, that's where it starts. And that doesn't totally go away. But he does actually seem to start caring about their interior lives or right. their their motivations or their personal struggles rather than just being like, wow, these beautiful women just keep throwing themselves at me and I can't resist. Um, <laughs> you know, he, he, he does he does slightly develop. The best example, yeah. I think, is Dorcas of that development. Oh, yeah. Because by the end, I, now I have said in my review of the series that I didn't feel a ton of emotional attachment, but where it finally started yeah. to happen for me was with Dorcas at the end yeah. of it, seeing her returning to the place where she had lived, which is now with this desolate, you know, the, the city has moved on. I love that concept, by the way, of the city that, that keeps shifting and the older parts are decaying and then the newer parts, yeah. it's evolu constant evolution. Um, but the, you see her in that part and Severian returns and he doesn't reveal to her his presence. And by now he's figured out who her son is, the waiter who had given him the the, the little note much, much yeah. earlier because Dorcas reminded him uh, of his mother. It turns out she is his mother uh, because of the way Gene Wolf plays with time. And there may even be a relationship with Severian, I guess, as well. Um, yeah. That this dude that might be his his uh, father, which would make Dorcas his grandmother. I guess is that. Did you guys pick up on that? That sounds familiar. Uh, which would be interesting. I remember being confused by it. So yeah, yeah. So I don't remember coming to a conclusion. Okay. Yeah. So his he he begins to, regardless of all that, I think he yeah. begins to see the humanity in Dorcas and to regret the way he treated her. And to and in that moment where he revisits her and sees her in her old home and arranges for her son to be reunited with her, uh, does all that, that's pure compassion coming from him and at, at that point. Yeah. Much different from the way he related to her earlier as a as a sexual object, essentially. Yeah. Well, and also I'm thinking, I'm thinking about just the first chapter of of Citadel, right? Like it begins with like he finds a body and he's kind of desperate to to revive it. Like Severian from Shadow of the Torture have been like, oh, he must have deserved it somehow. Uh, like, because in Severian's initial world that we are introduced to, like, people die because they did something wrong. It's a, it's this very simplistic, uh, black and white world. It's very binary. You know, you, if you, you, you alive, you're alive because you must be worthwhile and you're dead because you deserve to die because that's why torturers kill people. Yeah. Um, and he's, you know, after... Uh, you know, encountering the Hieroduels and Little Severian and fighting <laughs> Baldanders and everything. Yeah. Uh, like there's something in him that like, I, I, and he seems to not really understand himself why, but like it's important to him to try and and to successfully revive this dead soldier. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And then another instance is when he refuses to kill the woman uh, when he's in yeah. the sort of the lictor when he's it's his job and he's meant to and he understands the consequences as well of not killing yeah. what was her name um okay. anyway she was supposed yeah. to be executed by severian in sort of lictor and he he sleeps with her um and, but uh he refuses to kill her uh, and has to run away as a consequence um and goes out into the mountains and meets little severian who doesn't last very long does he <laughs> he just gets zapped Oh man, that was yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that this development though is is uh, 
a central part of the, the story as much as I can make of it. Um, but also the setting. This is a this is a dying earth narrative. Um, and the idea of uh, resurrection in that sense also is is pretty important. Um, yeah. But this is a world that uh, and maybe one of the most fascinating aspects of the series really is, is the world that Jingle sets up and how you slowly figure out what's going on here, beginning with, oh, they live in space in spacecrafts right you know yeah de defunct spacecrafts or maybe we yeah them. so yeah would you guys want to talk a little bit about that about the world building aspect of this and how that contributes to and, and also i think the sense of transcendence at the end the idea that this is a, this world is dying and there is this slim opportunity perhaps for severian to do something about it as the otark his, his predecessor apparently failed and and yes. and uh, lost his uh, his his uh, manhood, sort of, I guess, as a as a consequence. Oh yeah. Um, so what what do you think about all that? This whole dying Earth aspect of it. Uh, Jared, you want to go first? Yeah. Well, the, the world is sort of one of the most intriguing things for me, and you know, to sorry, when I made my top ten science fiction books list and my top ten fantasy books list. I've never gotten so many comments about like putting the book in the wrong list because I think I put it in my science fiction list and people are like, no, it's a fantasy book. And now I really think deep down, there isn't like a huge difference between science fiction and fantasy, but uh -huh. you know, for the purpose of the list, you have to make distinction, but it's weird, right? Because it feels like a fantasy book for most of the, uh, most of it, but it has all of these science fiction elements too. Like you discover that the towers that they live in are actually spacecraft that <laughs> never took off and like never will. Um, and, you know, it's a dying earth story in a world where things don't tend to stay dead. And that, that, that's, the, uh, and that, that always kind of makes it weird, right? Um, um, resurrection, coming back from the dead or finding new ways to survive, and like whether this is in the form of memory and like through like uh, your consciousness being imbibed or something is a major theme th th throughout this. Um, but there is like this, almost kind of nostalgic feeling also throughout of you know the roads aren't really the things you like the like traveling on the roads is different than it used to be clearly this was built when uh in a time when the empire or like whatever this civilization is was in like better a better condition and you have to um there's all this technology that clearly exists but now has kind of transmuted to seem like magic to people there's like genetic engineering that, that has clearly gone on but they just see it as there there are monsters among us um, and it's done in such a way that um, it's almost like they don't know the world they're in anymore. Right? Like they, like the the characters don't know their own world, um, and we have to piece it together almost almost with them. And only a few people really seem to understand this, right? And they're figures that will always speak obliquely and won't ever just like obviously tell you what's you know what's going on. Everyone refuses to be straightforward. No. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, Paul, your thoughts on the world building in Book of the New Sun? Yeah, I mean, I think um, really just wanted to add on to what Jared is saying is this element of reference, right? Uh, like Wolf leaves so much to you to kind of piece out. Wait, that is weird because uh, because it, it this world is so overly familiar. And yet I like Jared's point. So unknown to the people, right? Like there's a complete loss of history, certainly. Um, and because Vodalus is the only person who seems to have any aspirations about a past age. Um, everyone else is so, you know, I mean, the planet has been so impoverished by this uh, this punishment that the higher duels have imposed upon it mm. that no one is able to, no, no one has the, 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 really the emotional and mental resources to aspire to more. And yet we also get to intuit small things about where this world is. I was talking, uh, so I have a colleague who uh, she, when I told her I was doing these videos with Philip, she started reading the series and uh, she finished uh, back in August. And she's, she's of the opinion. I think there's something to it. The, uh, the, the big statue that where little Severian dies, where right. they're one, she, she, she's of the opinion that that's probably, that might be the giant Christ statue in Rio, for instance. Oh, um, mm -hmm. Because I know that uh, the general consensus amongst readers is that this is South America. This is the South American continent, 
Uh -huh. uh, certainly not culturally anymore. That's all mutated far beyond anything we would recognize. But uh, the continent is, is, and some people have, I know that there are like elaborate theories for why it might be Buenos Aires. Some have say it might be Rio. Some say it might be other places. But again, like there's just these small things that if on the one hand, if you just assume this is a secondary world, cool, there's random statues and it's kind of like being in Middle Earth, right? Tolkien gives you, you know, there's uh, so many references to the past ages of Middle Earth. Yeah. And, and Grant Tolkien will, you know, exposit a bit about those, but there's still a deep sense of a very thick history that we aren't seeing, but it creates a very lived-in mm -hmm. experience. And Wolf kind of does a similar technique, but he's, rather than having to invent a whole new mythology, he's referencing things that maybe still might be hanging around hundreds of thousands of years later, uh, even though we might expect them, you know, Ozymandias style to have completely decayed away. Yeah. Uh, and yet, maybe, maybe rather so, the memory has decayed. Yeah. Jared? So in, in, um, uh, so in the first season of the Wheel of Time show, right, which I will oh, not yeah. talk about in the detail, right, but <laughs> but there is this. Oh, is this going to be too spoilery if I if I mention anything? Should I should I avoid making anything like this this comparison? I don't think I don't I, want to ruin things. I think it's okay. If you watch, okay, if you watch that show, there's a moment when they they were leaving and they're going out into the wider world, and you see this big expansive shot, right? Yeah. Um, or it might be coming as like a transition from a flashback, and you can like see that some things that we think are like pillars and mountains or something are actually the ruins of buildings, right? Yeah. I don't like that being done in Wheel of Time for various reasons, but this is not a Wheel of Time chat. And people complaining about the first season of Wheel of Time is nothing new on the internet. But I will just, but, but <laughs> what I will say is that feeling is actually what you get in Book of the New Sun. Yeah. Yeah. Like in that, clo uh, that's clearly it. Yeah. That was and, not, and I would just, yeah. No. Yeah. And I, I would add like, like, you know, that's an interesting, uh, like that's a, I would argue kind of a mainstay, right? Of, of science fiction and fantasy of the, really the the 60s through the 80s uh like back in, and i think that was just the matter of the magazines that were publishing like it, it was easier to publish sci-fi and so you so authors who wanted to do fantasy had to uh often look for very science fiction informed ways of trying to do fantasy and also like you know that's also the time that we first start hearing about uh the anxieties of climate change everyone's terrified of, of nuclear proliferation at the time mm -hmm. and so like it was it, it was it's a very common trope and like, like I, for instance i'm excited for philip to do uh lord of light next month because that, that was i read lord of light earlier this year and a fun thing in that one is seeing how much that from 1967 informed book of the new sun right there there's a paragraph in the first chapter i was like that's book of the new sun right there interesting uh, yeah. so yeah, yeah but i think it's coming <clears throat> The fascination with vanished worlds is a very old one, actually. Yeah, and it's a big part of yeah. Beowulf, for example. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, the I elegy of the past age. Obviously, there's a lot of symbolism in this yes. series. A ton of symbolism. Some of the characters could be said to be more symbol symbolic. Yeah, uh, and mm -hmm. I I find we could probably talk for hours about the various symbols in here. But let's focus on uh, a central one: the claw of the conciliator. Uh, which is something that Severian carries around with him ever since Aegea puts it in his uh, little travel sack thing. Yeah. Uh, and he doesn't know it's there. And then later in the second book, he figures out, oh, I can bring people back to life with this, right? He's after unknowingly reviving Dorcas uh, in, in when he goes into the, the lake there, uh, he begins to figure out what this thing can do. Um, and later on, of course, loses it in battle with Baldanders. And we need to talk about <laughs> what Baldanders is and the Hyroduels and all that. Um, and then uh, rediscovers it though as, as a claw, but then uh, as, as a little hooked object that was inside the gem that had been shattered. And it's compared to a thorn at that point, which again, kind of goes back to the whole Christ thing, you know, the, the crown yeah. of thorns and all yeah. that. Um, what do you guys make of this claw of the conciliator thing? What is it? Uh, what is it? Might might my, my, some of its because I, I think a good symbol usually has more than one possible you know connotation. So what are the what are the connotations of this uh, as a symbol as you guys read uh, the claw of the conciliator? So I think um, I didn't. Uh, uh, well, the thing. So approaching it symbolically is actually a bit difficult because it, it potentially gets deflated in that respect it, mm -hmm. by the end of this book. Um, 
it, it certainly, and, and I think this is an important thing to what Wolf does is, okay, let me back up. So I'm thinking about an essay from Samuel R. Delaney called uh, about 1,575 words, or is wow. it 1,750 words, one of the two. Um, and Delaney, he, in this, he argues the one, the role of style in storytelling that the specific word choices inherently are a, an aspect of world building. And two, he argues a difference between fantasy and science fiction. He says that uh, fantasy has the ability where the author can simply say, this is a thing and it, and it is versus science fiction, which has, he calls it a subjunctive mode where it, uh, an author can mention things that the author, that the reader can intuit depending upon their familiarity with scientific principles. And so I think something that Wolf does um, that I think is one of the, the most impressive rigors that the series demands is everything has a very surface, natural, but not, uh, surface, but also a deep, like, like it's very rooted purpose, right? It, uh, in fantasy, you can often say, well, this thing is there because it, it has a thematic resonance. And that's why this they, they use this rather than that or whatever. Like the claw is presented to us as something that must have a naturalist value within the text. And yet we read it so thoroughly as symbolic. And so is it a tool of that that, that unlocks, that, 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 that has this ability to, to mess with time? Or is it simply something that Severian can do, but he thinks it goes to the claw? Or is it something else entirely? Is it magic uh, or is it technology? Yeah. Yeah. Or is it just a, literally just a thorn that someone stuffed into a jewel, but in Severian's hands can do things hmm. for whatever reason? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what do you and, think? Jared? And we also, well, we also get to see near the end, right, where it seems as if the power has gone out, right? Yeah. And it's another another instance of this world is a place where everything seems to just be decaying, right? Everything is sort of dwindling and is a little less robust than it used to be. But yeah, it's also the thing- fulfill, oh. I think importantly though, he does fulfill his quest. If you look at yeah. his quest mm -hmm. narrative, the the quest was for him to return this jewel to the Pellerines and, he, yeah. and they don't really want it. They're like, ah, whatever, you know, that, that, yeah. that, we don't care. But he he embeds it in that altar, I guess, is what it is, right? He yeah. finds a little niche for it and then puts it in there and rigs it in there. And then he feels like, I have accomplished my mission, you know, yeah. which is an interesting aspect of Severian that even earlier on, he felt this moral obligation to return this object to the Pellerines. Right? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that or not. Um, well, or I, I mean... Well, how much does that tell us about Severian as a character, right? Because in part, he obviously is cast out of the tortures and sort of, and sort of, sort of cast out because he violates one of the principles of their, of their order. Right. But for a very long time in the story, though, he does take seriously this idea that like there are these rules of these orders or these organizations and like the world just is this way. And so it's like part of my job is to, or part of like all of our duties is to just maintain this sort of, stability right the way things are so that's why even he doesn't have to question about the individual guilt of a man that he tortures and then executes as he travels right he never has to really wonder about that until a little bit later we see we that's a that's a change right but the pellerines returning the uh the claws of the pellerines might just be an instance of that interesting mm. does he not also though present himself in his narrative as a kind of chosen one uh, by the the hieroduels or whatever. I mean that he's been set up. This whole thing is also he's being basically felt out as the uh, successor to the Otark. And, mm, and yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that, that that does seem right. That, that, that I think that is correct. Um, it's 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 a book about it's it's a book full of conspiracy theories, but they're all true. It is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, this, this world government does manipulate you to, just, to get you to do what they want to uh, maintain their power. But is he a chosen? It just so happens it might be good. You, well, would you I agree think... with that that appellation that uh, Severian is is a chosen one. It, 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 it might even be accurate like, and truthful. Whoops. Okay. Uh, I don't know who which one was. Who. Why don't you try first, Paul? Paul, go ahead. I, I think I think uh, he is a chosen one if he's being truthful uh -huh. about all this. Again, like we have to. There, there's always room for the suspicion. I think that that's healthy. Um, and, and I think 
I think the claw actually is a big part of what complicates this because it's so ambiguous. At least I, 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 I've encountered enough discussions about the entire solar cycle without having read beyond these first four so far to understand that there's a lot of debate about if the claw maybe does have inherent ability or if the claw is just a, it, it, a lot depends on how much is the claw the source of power and how much of it is actually somehow severian mm -hmm. and uh because again there's the scene on the beach that seems to almost suggest that the claw is literally just a thorn someone wedged into, into some glass and that somehow some way severian can do it and like, that's why severian is the one that that the autarch kind of takes an interest in and then events start to kind of collapse into his pathway to suck him to, to drag him out of, of the Metachin Tower and onto this quest. Hmm. Okay. Jared, what do you think? Is Severian essentially just being set up to become the chosen one? In... Well, yeah, the point I was going to make is that if he's actually being set up, he is like a more literal version of a chosen one than most of the time that we see, because usually it's like fate chose me, right? Fate yeah. and circumstance chose me. But this is like, no, the guy in power chose me. <laughs> and, then, and then set it up so that I would become uh, become his successor. Yeah. Or the aliens in power in this case. <laughs> yes. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. After they built the pyramids. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, it does seem like that the Otark is simply somebody they appoint to try to fulfill this. Whoops. Oh, your cat's having fun back my, there. My cat just decided to knock over a bunch of books. So that's... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> excellent good job kitty yes uh yeah yeah but anyway yeah he, he seems to be um the implication very strongly is that he is coming to uh, this is a story of him coming to understand that he is being manipulated that he is being put in this role <laughs> which i think we have to talk about the ending the last 70 or so pages yeah. yes um, so, Paul, you look like you're ready to start on this. Um, what do you want to say about the last 70 or so pages, which are mind-blowing and yes. interesting and fascinating? Bring a lot of things together. And oh, in yeah. respect, of course, make a lot of other things sort of make sense. So what do you think? I mean, so so I, I remember distinctively when I first encountered this. Like, I remember it was uh, it was June in 2019. I was just reading this. It was, I was done with the semester. And and I've said before, I, I consider reading Gene Wolfe as an act of faith. You begin and you 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 persevere through a lot of I don't know what any of this means. Uh, and I'm very confused. You you persevere through a lot of that on faith that there is so much confidence behind this writing. There is so much deliberateness behind the narrative. There's this has got to work out. And for me, this is one of those great moments. It's, it's like those videos uh, where you know they they do this enormous array of dominoes and they push the one and you're just it's, okay you know, we're watching the dominoes fall and then suddenly you know the camera pans out and it's every tile has clipped into place right and like it, it retroactively rewrites for me the entirety of book of the new sun in yeah. a brand new way and again like I, I i'm very enthralled by the idea of transcendence and apotheosis um that that is a part of my own like cosmic worldview and so that all plays very nicely with me, um, but it, it's it's again it's the it's the perfected planning of it all, or at least I I, I can't really say that it's perfect because I ha I haven't read the series eighty times to really verify this, but it sure feels like I, I'm so convinced it feels so genius in its in its deployment, mm. but it's also done in a way that it, again it, it moves in a trajectory that I that I personally like. And I think it, it touches upon, uh, I, I think it opens up so many doorways for reading. Um, so one thing that, that uh, I, I really want to make sure I talked about, because I, I've, I've teased throughout all these videos, the, the question of Severian's memory, because yes. we have we have thoroughly debated. Um, his reliability you know, as a narrative. Yeah, his reliability. So, so, so I, I kind of I, I kind of gave a bit of this in the last video, but I want, I'm just want to lay it out here. Okay, so. Wolf is very heavily, very openly, very pronouncedly uh, a huge fan of Jorge Luis Borges. And yeah. there's a story by Borges called Funes, His Memory, or Funes, the Memorious, depending upon your translator. This is a story about a guy who falls off his horse, hits his head, and it triggers something in his brain. And his brain remembers everything. He starts to remember and like 
every specific instance of anything. He remembers every dream he's had. He remembers every individual leaf he ever saw on any tree. He remembers how it was on Tuesday versus how it was on Friday. Uh, wow. depending on, and, and two o'clock versus seven o'clock when the lighting changes. He remembers every iteration of this. But it's about this element of a memory that uh, through trauma is kind of uh, perfected in a weird mechanistic way. So Severian, we start to see uh, the issue. Philip has always been really interested in, in the way that you know he 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 uses Volatilis's version of the Alzebo analeptic, eats Thecla's brain, and gets and, and that starts to inform a big part of, of Severian. But then, you know, at Severian uh, ends up out in the battlefield crossing paths with the autark and the autark is dying mm -hmm. and so he gives severian he says this is like the alzo analeptic it is similar to the alzo analeptic that you had at Vodalis's feast and i have uh, this is the same thing that i used decades ago and uh i am going to uh you need to eat my brain and absorb hundreds if not thousands of past autarks and, and you become this composite individual. So a few things. One, I think that the version of the Oswald Analeptic that Severian gets is from, from the Autark is the perfect version, or is this platonic ideal of the Analeptic, that Vodalis's version is, you know, I made this in my basement and it does the, it does the job, right? <laughs> um, and that when you combine that, and, and so I think that that triggers something that causes, so that point being, I think Severian has an imperfect memory as a child. And I think that after he becomes the Otark, his memory truly is perfect. And so, but it, it's so perfect that he, that as he's narrating his story, he is actually fully inhabiting that memory. And so he tells it as it, as he experienced, as he, as he perfectly remembers being able to, to live that moment. And so he's able to have a perfect memory while also not. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, fascinating. Yeah, excellent. Jared, thoughts on and of all. course, and 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 of course, though he's um he's able to remember the same experience from multiple perspectives, and that's like the, that's one of the weirdest things about the about this fact. So he he can remember what it's like to be Severian talking to Thecla, but also Thecla talking to Severian. Yeah, uh, and that's that is a that that must be a disorienting experience uh, experience itself to kind of know yourself from the inside and the out uh, out in a way i mean i think i i tend towards thinking that if someone's memory is like fundamentally changed or altered there's a fairly strong philosophical case for them just not being the same person right uh and, and so <laughs> when we get into the last 50 to 70 pages of both of the new sign the question of like is this Severian as we have met him before? What it is, is this is the Severian we have now been hearing from the whole time. <laughs> it's just that in, in some ways, it's like Severian was describing his own, what we take to be his own story early on, but it wasn't really his story. It's like sort of Severian prime. It's like the, it's like the original Severian yeah. who is part of the causal history of this conglomeration that is now the person we call Severian who becomes Lothar. And who has to so he's he that Severian is like little Severian gone with the wind. Yeah. 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 It, 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 exactly. And and it you know because now he is Thecla, now he is Severian, now he is the Autark. And I think that the way this works, especially with the 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 with the Autark, if this is like the perfect version, I, I like this this that Paul's point there. If that's like the perfect version, he is just as much the Autark as he was Severian. Yeah. And, and so to just going, think that he is Severian. If we're going on the premise that you are your memories, your identity is essentially your memories, which I think we all know that our memories are quite imperfect, right? Which raises another question. If you, when In saying you have a perfect memory, are you claiming that you have a memory that's essentially like a recording device? Um, because memories are not accurate, right? What, yeah. what does it mean for a Severian's claim, you know? So I don't still 100% trust his his uh, what he, the implication seems to be. I have a perfect memory, so therefore what I'm telling you is truth. Well, mm -hmm. I don't actually buy that because I think memories are notoriously unreliable, right? Yeah. I mean, so every, every memory is like the recording of a fact, however perfect, 
and an accompanying interpretation of those facts. Right. There is no sort of bare recording of, 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 mm -hmm. uh, of fact in your mind that you're right. always projecting onto this. It could be, I mean, think about it. When, when say, say, say someone walks into the room, right? So, so Philip, your, your wife walks into the room, right? You immediately sort of, we all could perfectly record like the physical facts of that, of that event, right? But the interpretation of that is different. For me, it's a woman I've never seen before. Right for you, it's this person who, with whom I share this this uh, this history and whom I have these bonds. Right, all these oh, emotional associations, before, but never, yeah, yeah. May, but you don't have the same. So all three of us there, and so our memories, even if we get to see the same footage, so to speak, right, are going to be different because of the things we bring to it just just as much. So then, imagine now that you get to revisit your memories, but with the differing interpretations of a whole lineage of. Of, of ruler of, of, of earth and additionally a woman that you loved right uh, um and to, to think like what what are you now? like what what are you who knows yeah well hopefully i guess some transcendent being that can bring about a new sun right Is it, that's the deal yes. i guess i mean i haven't read past book of the new sun so i assume that we 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 simply we, where we leave with severian is essentially we we learn that as he's writing this, he's in a spacecraft going up to try to accomplish yeah. this mission. Uh, I don't know how that happens or anything, but I, I assume that's kind of going to be addressed in Earth of the New Sun and Book of the Long Sun and Book of the Short Sun somewhere along the line. So um, I've I've only read Earth of the New Sun to go past this, and I won't spoil anything about that, but to just say that it basically picks up, right? It's just going to say, yeah. what is now this mission, right? That's that that's the that's the story. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, as much as yeah, anything, and of course, makes because sense. it's wolf, and because because it's wolf, you would not be able to guess what that story is. Yeah. From knowing that premise, you would you will have no idea actually the directions in which it will go. Yeah. Uh, that I assumed. <laughs> yeah, this also raises a question about. I'm sorry, Philip. No, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is a question about, like, you know, the the Autark project, right? Uh, the the, the mm -hmm. Autark initiative, as Nick Fury might call it. Um, where uh, is it just a matter of we just keep trying until we get it? Or the way I tend to look at it is this very, it is a bit more linear in that there is each autark is introducing new things, you know, their lived experience, their specializations, these things will somehow in some important way contribute. And that something Severian brings to the table is important is deemed important to possibly passing whatever test the higher duels will impose, um, and uh, I, I I think this is something that's debated amongst Wolf fans. But uh, then you know it gets into questions of like, well, what does Severian bring? And uh, maybe it is in some ways this dispassionate quality, right? That it's someone who can have a godlike perspective on Earth, but is and, and is both rich in compassion, right? We talked a lot about how Severian's quest brings him to being a more compassionate individual. And I would argue that's because, I mean, he gets to do it in a very literal way. He truly gets to know other people in yeah. ways that we can't, right? Yeah. Uh, he gets to know Thecla on an, a level of intimacy that no none of us has ever done and, and all the other autarchs. Um, but is it the fact that we need a torturer who, we, we need someone who is willing to do the things right because of the, you know there's the part when uh when he's in this the spacecraft uh after the votalist camp issue and he, he's getting told all the things right and uh and it suggest it's pointed out like because the sun has cooled off so much the ice caps have expanded and people have been settling and someone if we're going to revive the new sun someone someone who loves the earth enough to revive the new sun but is willing to cause a flood in the process. Mm. Someone who's willing to uproot people, who's willing to, to, mm. to do grand cosmic level action that ultimately is for the good, but does have a price of suffering imposed upon people in the process. Like, do, is, does that what Severian brings to the table? Yeah. It's interesting because we have two, a couple of premonitions of the future here. We have a couple yeah. of characters who come from the future. One is the green man. Uh, yes. The other is the the old dude that Severian is supposed to bring back to the camp. Um, and he lives in that, mm. that, that cabin in this remote area. And when Severian essentially forces him along with him, he disappears because he, he, can't, he can only exist in that space, I guess. 
Yeah. Uh, so we do learn something about the future from these characters, do we not? The the one the yeah. green man and the one old man who seems to imply that the future is a lot colder. Uh, I don't know how the, they must be from different parts of the future, I guess. Uh, but the green man whom Severian saves and then later saves Severian in turn. Yeah. I, or are they from different futures? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I I don't know, right? But is it possible that they're from different futures, or are they just from different parts of the world? Yeah. With it, with Wolf, I feel like there's never going to be like it would it would be hard to assume one or the other. Yeah. Huh. And the whole the whole I mean the whole thing about him translating this into English, uh, if, uh translating a story from the future, um, into the language of the present. I mean, he has that wonderful conceit that I think it's at the end of the first book where he lets you know. Oh, yeah. Buddy, I'm translating this and I somehow got this document from the future, which I'm translating. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so layered. Uh, another thing I think we're talking about in connection with all, all this, about the issue of, you know, the higher duels and, and the Severian chosen and whatnot, right. Is right. this concept of the divine year um, where that's, you know, like that's the part where it's just, you know, your brain just kind of shuts off and smoke comes out of your ears, I think. Right. This idea that, uh, that the universe is on this, cosmic scale cycle right and when the when that timeline when that clock runs out the universe is destroyed but there are higher beings who have managed to find a pocket dimension they can get into but that's like that's like the autark's job is to kind of guide humanity into being in that pocket um and that that's I don't know how much how much of this is gene wolf trying to naturalize divinity how much of this is gene wolf just trying to present something cool how much of this is severian just trying to tell his audience there's a grand mystery in the future that none of you will ever live to see but it's important you all <laughs> obey me in the meantime right like there's also things we can read into this i think i'm also really intrigued by it because um you know so so this is published the same time that another favorite of mine john crowley's novel little big comes out which is far and away the most gorgeously written novel i've ever read in my life um but it has a very similar conceit at the end but it's through fairies rather than through aliens mm -hmm. um and, yeah. I, and i wonder if what, what it is about these two catholic background crowley himself an atheist but with a catholic background and wolf as a methodist converted to catholicism they both at because little big is published in 1981 at the same time as that halfway through book of the new sun being published and i wonder what it is about that time period these two authors their experiences that brought them to have this very similar conceit that they achieve through radically distinct uh, approaches. And they're both mesmerizingly awesome texts. Ah, cool. Nice connection there. All right, well, I'm gonna be conscious of your time, but I, I do wanna ask you both, is there anything that we have not talked about from Book of the New Sun that you feel is important or you would like to cover? Whoops, uh, you are muted. muted. No, sorry. It, no, I feel like if we were doing like a plot by plot discussion, which I know this is not it, there are so many plot points that I just have no idea what's going <laughs> going on. I'm sort of prepping for my next big read of this. And I feel like I'm going to have to have a pencil in hand to have like secondary material. <laughs> I'm going to have to like find podcasts or guides online that will walk me through it or yeah. something like this. I don't think you should do that for your first read of this. I want to really flag that i think you need to get yourself lost in wolf for a while but i think i need to do that because who knows what's going on man it's, it's so it's so confusing so i i feel very strongly that this is not a plot driven story that the plot is if you just focus on the plot it's almost absurd how there are so many weird like just conveniences or coincidences people who just come into the story like a, a prop almost getting wheeled onto the stage for its moment and then wheeled off the stage and then it wheels back in, you know, at the right moment. And it's just like, like meeting bald enders uh, or, and Dr. Uh, Talos at just these yeah. particular times. And they, Oh, you, they just happened to be when Severian and, and Jonas escape from uh, their, their little uh, situation. They just bump right into uh, Dr. Talos and bald enders and, 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 uh, and Dorcas doing the play. It's like, oh, what a coincidence, you know? Uh, so all these things just keep, like the plot is almost like, ir no, I don't want to say irrelevant, but it's, it's. I feel like it's much more theme driven 
uh, idea driven than most things that people are going to read these days. Um, and, and a lot of people read for plot, they read for character. Uh, I don't think that's what this is. This is much more idea theme driven than anything. So, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I often say that Gene Wolfe writes like a modernist in that respect. Uh -huh. Like there's a lot of technical fireworks that are, I don't even want to say that they're like, like I, I don't want to diminish from the plot and say that you know the plot is just a vehicle to give you the fireworks. I think that that does a disservice to the text. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that there's something to be said for, again, this is not a text that you read for companionship. Um, you, 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 you know, you read uh, like Robin Hobb, for instance, is something right. you read for. You know, I'm spending time with my with my buddies doing the buddy thing and. Fitz, why are you doing that, man? Don't make me cry, man. And, and, and Wolf is not doing that, right? He, he is, but there is, I, I think the plot itself is substantive, but I think it's so, it's not a plot, like fundamentally, the vast majority of what we read is in many cases, the same story told just slightly differently over and over again, for whatever story that matters to us, right? Different people will like this. Some people it's a romance story, for some people it's an adventure story, for some people it's one, something else entirely. Um, and uh, I mean, in some ways, Wolf kind of is doing that. Like, this is a familiar. Like, we, we've seen this story, but we've never seen it like this. I mean, uh -huh. you know, we we have this this culmination point with the uh, with, with with Severian consuming the Autark's brain, and you know, we we have one chapter called the uh, the Secret of the Universe, and another one called uh, the Corridors of Time. Like, big meaty stuff, and there's still like. 30 pages after that of like small episodes of Severian just kind of doing one thing, then another, and then like, oh, and by the way, I'm about to take off into space. Cool. Um, like it's <laughs> it's not a it, it's not structured in a way. It, it does not aim for easy emotional payoff that so many authors do do because and, and they do that because we have found that that just works. Humans are predictable in desiring that. Um, Wolf is trying to do something different. He's trying to use that structure, but he's trying to, he's, he's saying, I'm not satisfied with that storytelling for the thing that I want to do. I agree. That's well put. Yeah. All right. I, I so I, I actually am a little pressed because I'll have to log off very soon, but I will just say yeah. there's this great line in um, William Gibson's introduction to Samuel Delaney's Dahlgren, which is, it seems a little tangential, where he writes, that Dahlgren is a, he's talking about how wonderful this book is. Dahlgren is not a puzzle, or Dahlgren is a puzzle that was not meant to be solved. Uh, and I think in some ways, this is true for Book of the New Sun as well. It, it can yeah. be fun to think through them, but you think that you will come to a final resolution where all of the pieces have clicked into place is, is probably a fool's errand, but that does not take away from the beauty, the majesty, and just the genius yeah. of, of this work. That's all I'll ever have is an approximation. Yeah, I, I think let's let that be the last word then. And I want to thank you both for this discussion. Yeah. I enjoyed it. I'm not sure I figured out Book of the New Sun, but that's okay. <laughs> and I'm so glad that uh, you two have helped me along here. Uh, this was a lot of fun. Appreciate it very much. Uh, as for some yeah. reason you don't know about Jared Henderson's channel, I will have a link in the description. I'm pretty sure everybody knows <laughs> Uh, your channel by now, but uh, I'll have a link there. And Paul, we're looking forward to you starting your channel someday. I'll be shouting about it when it happens. Uh, oh, thank uh, you. Yeah, all oh, my pleasure. Thank you both very much. And everybody, yeah. until next time.